Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. And if you are a friend of the foundation and you've been uh, watching the show for a long time, we've been having the show on almost a year now, you may know the significance of this shirt, which means it's party time, it's vacation time. And usually it means I'm leaving for vacation, but I'm actually actively on vacation right now. The first vacation of the summer, you know, I'll know I had a kid a few months ago and summer is actually over, but uh, I'm down at the beach with my family and this is how dedicated I am to the show. So I'm signing on from Emerald Isle, North Carolina. I want you to tell me where you are signing on from. If you've been a, a, a regular here at the show, you know that is the drill and, and we love to see how far these programs reach and inevitably we have people from all over the world tuning in live, which is very, very exciting. Um, and if you don't know much about me, I'm a filmmaker and I've been working with CCF for almost 10, actually not almost, it's 10 years, creating video content like this live video series, as well as produced videos that we've done for over a decade. And they are available on the videos tab and also on the YouTube channel for Carcinoid Cancer Foundation. Tell us where you are signing on from in the world. Say hello to everybody else in the chat box. Before we get started, we always like to thank our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, this program would not be possible. And we always like to include this disclaimer from them. And that is that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information expressed uh, in, the, in the presentation. And audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they may make about their health or treatments. Okay, so that last line is really the takeaway. We're gonna give you some good answers to your questions, some good advice, but we really don't know your specific case. So we want you to take that advice back to your home team that does and make the best plan for you moving forward. So today I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Sandy Kataya. How are you, Dr. Kataya? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show today. Absolutely. I know the folks are excited. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with you and the work that you do, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you work, and, and the role that you fill in this neuroendocrine tumor community. Sure. Uh, my, um, I live in Baltimore, Maryland, and okay. I've been working here at Mercy Medical Center for about 11 years, and I started a neuroendocrine program about 11 years ago, uh, mainly through um, the encouragement of the head of the cancer center here who felt that there were a lot of neuroendocrine patients who didn't have a center to do multidisciplinary care on them. So I'm happy to say that the Nurnequin Center has built to over 800 patients today. Um, and I've seen patients from different states, different areas, and it's been a very um, rewarding disease to treat in a lot of ways. I've met a lot of amazing people and I've learned a lot and I continue to learn a lot. And I've made a lot of great um, connections with colleagues across the country who also have an interest in Nurnequin tumors. So I'm happy to be here, happy to talk about whatever you guys wanna talk about today. Awesome, sounds good. Everybody signing on, we got New York, Connecticut, Indiana, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Paula, I'll be there uh, in a few weeks, I think. Um, okay, folks, so go ahead and start sending in your questions and we will take them and try to answer as many as we can. That's what we do every week. Now, inevitably, we get so many questions that often we don't get to all of them. So if we don't get to your question, I urge you to follow up with CCF to, to uh, either here, you can message them um, privately on the Facebook page. You can also reach them at carcinoid.org and they will try to get you the information that you seek. That is our job. Uh, so a couple of things I like to ask before we get started, we wanna to try to get as many people here as possible. I think the community that we have cultivated in the, in the program and in the comment section is just, it's really special. And I think that the information that we provide in this virtual interactive one-on-one -on -one session is crucial as well. So if you know someone who would benefit from this, the real benefit is being here live and getting their questions uh, asked and answered, tag them in the comments, share this video to their page, call them, email them, text them, whatever you got to do. Let's try to get as many people here as possible. And my second ask is, uh, as I always say every week, if you see a question in the, in the sidebar that you also have, or you're also interested in the answer to, under right under the question, you, you have a, a word, you, it says like, and it says reply. And if you hover over the like, it'll give you several emojis you can use. They all work the same way for me, folks. And if you like that question or love it or whatever you choose, it lets me know there is a demand for that question. It kind of upvotes it. If I see seven people have that question, well, we're, we're scrubbing through 
a hundred questions, I'm going to know that's a really important one to get across. So that really helps me do my job, which is to serve you. So I'd appreciate that very much. And you all have been doing a great job of that so far. Um, this is a special episode. This is a special month that we have. And so today and throughout all of September, we're recognizing and appreciating amazing women physicians in the net community. September is Women in Medicine Month. Uh, it's an annual program from uh, AMA, the Amer American Medical Association. So I would like for you to join us as we thank net physicians for sharing their expertise, care, and compassion throughout the year. And, uh, and we're thrilled to highlight some of the, uh, the, the female net physicians that we have across the country and across the globe. So shout out to Dr. Kataya and the rest of the Thank women. Thank you. That's leading. wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you told me that you had 280 patients yearly, roughly. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, probably on average, I meant that much, maybe a little bit more because it's probably increased over time, but sure. we've seen over 800, over 800 patients in our center so far, probably closer to 900. And I am a medical oncologist by training, by the way, because I know we all approach nerdkin tumors differently. There's a lot of people involved, surgeons, interventional radiologists, medical oncologists. So that's sort of my background, if that helps with any of these questions. Um, I'll do my best, of course. But if it's not something that I personally do, like I don't really cut people open, I'm not going to be able to say much. I'll give you some general idea of what I understand. But, you know, I can't give you details about things like what kind of surgeries and how long you recover yeah. from them. And, and, and what percentage of your patients are net patients? In my practice, about a third, I would say, are net patients. And I see thousands of patients a year. So it's really, um, you know, it's really a, a big part of my practice. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I definitely um, enjoy and learn from every patient because every net patient's a different, and you think you've seen a lot of the same, but then sometimes somebody walks in with a different presentation of the same thing and you learn, you continue to learn, which is amazing. Absolutely. We talk about that often on the show is how, how each case is different and, and therefore each path is different. Each patient is different and, you know, and therefore each, each path forward is, is different as well. Um, when you started the, you said the net program that you started was, was it 10 years ago, 11 years ago? Almost, almost 11. Yeah. 10, 11 years ago is when I started it. Yes. Yeah, so, I came straight out of fellowship. I was at Jefferson in Philly, Thomas Jefferson in Philly. Uh -huh. This was my first job um, out of training and um, there was just an very deep interest from one of the cancer surgeons who was the head of the Cancer Institute to like start a, a neuroendocrine center because he felt like he was seeing more and more patients with neuroendocrine tumors over the years and he just wanted to create a center for them. So it was his brainchild, shall we say, and it's worked out very well and I've learned a lot from it. So I'm always grateful to him from that, for that. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. Well, uh, Dr. Kataya, we've already got some good questions coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, grabbing some from the office. The first one comes from Marsha. Uh, Marsha says, is there any connection with vitamin D and the gastro symptoms from carcinoid syndrome? And a few other people are, uh, are curious about this as well. You know, it's so funny. 85% of the people in the Northeast are vitamin D deficient because we don't get enough sun. Hmm. Um, and, and it's so easy to like link vitamin D with so many things, the cancer development, breast colon cancer development and, you know, bone health and all those things. As far as I know, there's not a link. Um, we do try to fix vitamin D levels. Do we really know exactly what that does? Probably not. Does it probably have some impact on bone health? I think it does. Cause we know that bone, bone needs calcium and vitamin D. Um, but you know, as far as I know, there's no link. Got it. You said 85% of people in the Northeast are, are vitamin D deficient. That so seems like a big number. Sun. We don't get enough sun. That seems so, like a big number. It is a big number. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Marcia, for your question. Hopefully that, that helped a little bit. But uh, if you have a follow-up question, let us know. Moving on to Diana, is the copper 64 scan uh, more sensitive than the gallium 68? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I think I get asked often, um, you know, are you going to switch to copper 64? And I looked into that um, and I talked to John Strasberg, who's another that big neuroendocrine guy. And I've talked to some of the other colleagues. And, you know, what we think is that it actually might help if you have a very small primary tumor and you're trying to locate it, mm -hmm. it might give you some yield there. But in terms of, is it dramatically better than the gallium 68? Not really. And for the purposes of what we do, which is to look at those scans to determine who needs um, octreotide or lanreotide injections or who needs like targeted radiation with PRT, 
you know, I, we don't think the Copper 64 adds any more information to try to give those types of treatment versus the Gallium 68. So I really haven't switched over to the Copper 64 for my uh, nuclear medicine imaging. Got it, got it, got it. Folks, if, you, uh, if you're just joining us or you joined us a little bit late, we, this is uh, Carson and Cancer Foundation's program, Luncheon of the Experts. We're here with Dr. Sandy Kataya. And uh, per her previous response, a little extra shout out to jo Dr. Jonathan Strasberg, who we've worked with several times and has uh, done some great, uh, some great programs with us and, and videos. He was on the show. We've done some produced videos with him as well. And so he's, he's a friend of the foundation too. Good. He's awesome. he's a, guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's awesome at, at what he does. I even got him to, to crack, crack a couple smiles when he was on, on the show. Yeah, <laughs> yes. You know, he's like he's all, actually all, very nice. all- Yeah, he's a very he's, nice guy. He's, he's, he yeah, is. absolutely. He's, he, yeah. He's serious. <laughs> he's yeah. all he's all business, but uh, he's, he's he was very nice to me. He opened up his home to me, and I and I filmed the interview with him there. Aww. Okay, next question from Ursula. Ursula, hello, our friend from South Africa. Should I stop after four rounds of PRRT treatment? Uh, I'm doing fairly well, and I have started experiencing shrink shrinkage. That's great, great news, Ursula. My team is uh, my team busy applying. Okay, my team is busy applying for another two rounds uh or should i uh wait for a year or two you know that's a, that's a very interesting question so in the u.s we've only uh been approved for four treatments of prt that's how the, the trial was studied um another trial and you know and i've had patients get really great responses and by that i mean either shrinkage or stabilization and it can last them some years and there is some toxicity with PRRT, which is thankfully not very high, but there's some risk of kidney damage or some risk of bone marrow aging. So, you know, and, and the treatment is not meant to be curative. It's just meant to buy you time and hopefully control some symptoms from hormone production. So I try to reserve the extra two doses for when people relapse. So if they've gotten a really good treatment out of the first four and they've like, they're, it's like years later and they're starting to have some amount of growth then I try to retreat them with a couple more doses. And I think the Europeans, that's what that's how they kind of handle giving extra doses. I try to kind of reserve it and, and let patients enjoy the revision that they're getting from the current four treatments. So if it was me, I probably wouldn't. Um, I probably would hold off and let you write it out for however long this current four treatments helps you, which hopefully will be some years. And then in the future, you know, things might change. We might be using a different agent, something that lasts a little bit longer or works a little bit better because when you retreat with PRRT, the response rates are not quite as high. They're still good, but they're not quite as high as the first time. So, you know, things might change, you know, three or four years from now, and then we might be offering a different type of targeted radiation, but I, I probably wouldn't uh, give you all six at this point. Gotcha. Thanks, Ursula. Hopefully that helped. Let me know if you have another question. Next question, you know, all of these questions are great because multiple people are liking these questions. So first of all, everybody at home, thanks for doing that. And I'm also glad that um, that you all are interested in the same topic so that we can help a lot of people with just a few answers. So Aaron says, and this is an interesting question. Aaron says, what is the typical fuel pipeline of carcinoid tumors? Are they primarily fueled by glucose, glutamine, fat? Would this be specific to each person? And if it is specific to each person, what tests can be performed to obtain that information? Uh, in addition to the standardized treatments, what diet changes are being researched and tested not only to control carcinoid disease symptoms, but to starve the actual tumors and prevent growth? So a couple of questions in there. Let's start with the first one about the fuel pipeline. Is there a typical fuel pipeline for uh, carcinoid tumors that you know of? You know, I have to say, I probably would be owning my own island and sipping cocktails if I knew what drove the growth of some tumors. It's really, and it's really frustrating because people want to, in general, understand why something happened to them and whether they did something that caused it and what they can do to prevent it from getting worse. And, and that always comes back to basics for most of us, which is we, we always ingest food. That's something that we introduce to ourselves, into ourselves. Um, and there must be something in that that caused, and you know, it's true that neuroendocrine tumors have been rising steadily in the last 50 something years. We've seen more cases. We think that there's something environmental. We haven't been able to pinpoint it. Um, and we think part of it is because we have better technology. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as far as I know, you know, there's no particular food or hormone um, that leads to the development of the neuroendocrine tumors. Um, just like we don't know why some people get 
regular adenocarcinomas um, who are not smokers, not drinkers, and not doing any sort of uh, taking in any kind of carcinogens, which are you know, which are chemicals that cause cancer. Um, so you know, it's hard to sort of say to people, well, you need to cut this food group out. You need to do this because this is what caused your cancer. Because there are a lot of people who eat very healthy and plant based and vegan, and they still get cancer. So it's not that simple, and it's not as simple as starving yourself of sugar either, because your normal cells need, need sugar to function, like especially your brain. So it's just a matter of, you know, eating more plant-based, that's what the cancer guidelines recommend. Make sure you exercise two and a half hours a week, you get your heart rate up. Um, make sure you avoid alcohol and tobacco, you know, that's that's sort of like the general guidelines from, from the NCCN, the National Cancer uh, Conference of Cancer Network to try to reduce the development of cancer in 20 to 40% of patients. But once you have cancer, there's no diet that, that necessarily controls the cancer. Mm -hmm. So you just have to, you know, eat healthy because it'll help you feel better. It'll help you um, get through your treatments better, you know, and exercise and things like that. So I'm sorry that there's not some great, amazing answer as to what caused it and what you can do to prevent it from spreading. You just have to take your treatments. Hopefully they will work, keep yourself fit, keep yourself active, and hopefully your quality of life will be maximized and you'll be responding to treatment and continue to have, you know, prolongation of your life and good quality of life. And uh, Aaron and, and anyone else interested in, in this question or really any of the topics uh, that we'll probably touch on, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, I've been working with CCF for 10 years. We've created a lot of video content in that amount of time. Some on this show, we've been doing this show for over a year now. And then all the video content we've we've created over over the years, and so you can go to our YouTube channel or just the videos tab here on Facebook. For and where I'm going with all this is we've had lunch with the experts episodes with nutritionists and, and dietitians. We have I think we have video content on that as well. So they that may help. And as more of a blanket statement, we have we have a lot of different topics that we've uh, dove a little bit deeper into in that database of videos. And so if, if a question comes across that you have follow-up questions to, there's a lot of resources that we have available to you. And that one, uh, specifically for nutrition and diets, you know, there's some people that that's literally all, all they do that uh, hopefully that can, that can help as well. So I, I urge you to check those out. Uh, but thanks for your question. Also, Aaron, I think that you asked that question uh, kind of on the, the promotional post that we put. Uh, and this is where we field the question. So thank you for showing up and, and asking your question live. I'm glad you made it to the show. Uh, next question from Jim. I had a primary in the pancreas. Now I'm dealing mainly with liver metastasis slash uh, starry liver. What kind of research and advancements are being made in relation to care and treatment options for patients who do not have receptors for whom PRT Y90 radio embolization are not an option? Okay, so I mean, Jim, I, I guess what I don't know is whether your tumor is fast growing or slow growing. Mm -hmm. um, because fast growing tumors don't usually express a lot of somatostatin receptors. Um, and that's what we try to pick up um, when we do gallium scans. So if you have a faster growing pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, you usually rely on chemotherapy to control the growth. Um, and Y90 is a type of radiation, big radiation uh, dose that we give directly to the liver through the arteries that feed the right and left side. And we do that only in cases where we feel that somebody has a fast growth um, and we need better fast control because the short-term, well, the consequences of, of Y90 to the liver or liver-directed therapy is that sometimes the amount of radiation the liver gets can lead to cirrhosis and liver failure within a couple of years. So we try not to do that kind of treatment of people who we expect have a slow-growing tumor and can live for quite a long time. So, uh, so I would have to know whether your tumor is a fast-growing or slow-growing one to better answer your question. All right. Thanks, Jim. And, and if you have a follow-up question to that or want to provide us with any more information for clarity, I uh, hope you're still here and go ahead and uh, try to do that. Next question from Angela. Angela says, my husband only has one kidney. His net has metastasized to the liver and he's had two rounds of PRT, but he stopped because the numbers weren't looking, weren't good. Uh, one liver lobe is stable, one sees growth, and he has somatostatin injections. And we're thinking of a liver embolization, but worried about the contrast dyes affecting the kidney. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Kataya? Did when you say the numbers were getting worse, do you mean the kidney numbers were getting worse, or do you do you mean that his cancer was having a mixed response, some growth, some shrinkage? His net has metastasized the liver. We've had two rounds of PRT, but stopped because the numbers weren't good. 
Um, so I think that is pertaining to the liver, but I'm not sure. So, no. you know, because, you know, so, uh, you know, PR, so PRRT is a treatment where you can take, it can take all four doses to work. Mm -hmm. um, so there are people who have heterogeneity, which means that you expect the cancer cells to all look the same under the microscope. But sometimes when you biopsy one area, it's a slower growing area. You biopsy a different area, in, even in the same mass, it's a faster growing area. So PRT tends to work best for the slower growing endocrine tumors that really have very good somatostatin receptor expression. The faster growing areas don't respond as well. So you don't necessarily want to see what we call a mixed response where some areas are getting better, some areas are getting worse. You want all of it to be controlled. But again, like if some of it is getting worse, but it's really not dramatically worse, it's not more than 20% change, then you might want to stick it out and get the last two doses of PRT in to see whether it'll finally kick in because it can take all four doses to work. However, if it's significant amount of change in some in an area of the liver, and then the other area is okay, then and, but you but it's a significant change, then you do have to abandon that treatment and move on to the next treatment. And you know the embolize the chemoembolizations. You know I usually defer to the interventional radiologist in terms of what kind of parameters that they set in terms of giving that treatment. But they usually tend to worry more about the effect on the underlying healthy liver. Do you have enough healthy liver to take this medication? Um, they don't necessarily, you know, there's a diload, of course, so they do kind of worry about the kidneys, but they they would be the ones to explain to you whether it's a safe procedure and whether they expect to cause any more complications, especially in somebody who's just having one kidney, because you do need your kidneys and your liver to function to get rid of drugs and to make sure that you metabolize things. So you don't want one treatment to close off other avenues if they cause kidney damage, and that could be a big problem. So I would suggest that you talk to the interventional radiologists and go through because there's different forms of embolization. There's bland embolization, there's chemoembolization, there's radioembolization. So they could go over the, the pros and cons and whether they think is safe for him. Got it. Thanks for your question. Uh, hopefully that helped Angela. And again, I'll always reiterate folks, if you have follow-up questions and you're still on the show, go ahead and, and send them one and hopefully we can get to them later. Next question from Kelly. Um, Kelly said, I had a peanut removed in January of 2019, and for about the last six months, I've had horrible bloating, gas, distension, uh, no matter, that happens no matter what I eat. Um, so she's asking about gas post-surgery. Is that, is that common? And if so, uh, is, what, if anything, can be done? So I'm not a surgeon, right? But the, the thing that I would worry about is, well, there could be something, you know, it's funny because everybody's always like, oh, no endocrine tumors, nobody thinks of them. But then this community always thinks about that, but people don't always tend to think about common stuff. Like, do you have irritable bowel syndrome? Um, do you have pancreatic insufficiency? Did they remove enough of your pancreas that you're not making enough pancreatic enzyme to digest or absorb your food well? And there's ways to test for that. There's, you know, the pancreatic elastase test they can see whether you, if your stools are floating or you're losing weight or you're having a lot of gassiness or indigestion, it could be something that simple. And certainly the GI doctor should be able to help you with that uh, to figure out whether it's some kind of irritable bowel syndrome or some kind of problem with the pancreas being removed and you're not making enough pancreatic enzyme anymore to help digest your food properly. Got it, got it, thank you. Uh, Jim chimed back in. Jim was, uh, who had the liver metastases and starry liver who's asking about Y90 radio embolization yeah. And PRT, he actually, he said he had slow growing um, uh, and he was asking about the option for patients who do not have receptors, but he does have a slow growing too. I mean, so that's the thing, like Jim, if you, if, if it is, does happen, it's frustrating to us, but it does happen that some patients have slow growing tumors and they don't have the receptors. And in that case, you're right, PRT is not going to be the treatment that we offer you. But still, you can get liver-directed therapy. I wouldn't recommend radioembolization necessarily because, again, if you're expected to live a while despite the liver involvement, which you can with slow-growing neuroendocrine tumor, you don't want to take a treatment that can potentially cause liver failure in a few years. So I, you can, But you can think about bland embolization where they just cut off the blood supply to the tumor. You can think about chemoembolization. There's also medications that we give like Everolimus or Sutent, which disrupt blood vessel growth of the tumor, which can stabilize endocrine tumors. In about 80% of patients, there's been a few trials looking at that, like the radiant trials. Um, so, you know, it, it just kind of depends um, on where you are. Sometimes we still, I think, I don't know if you told me you progress on somatostatin analog, but we still try somatostatin analog, but it doesn't tend to work as well on people who don't have 
positive gallium scans. Uh, so, you know, so there's other things that can be done. And of course there's clinical trials. Dr. Strasberg has one and Dr. Chen has one that looks pretty good where they are trying to do immunotherapy combined with a targeted pill hmm. like pembrolizumab and lenvatinib. So, you know, there's hmm. always options for trials if the conventional stuff that we have to offer you is not working. And of course we still offer chemotherapy, Zolota Temidar, for neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, especially because they tend to be more sensitive to the chemotherapy regimen. So th there are options for you other than PRRT, even though that's probably disappointing that you couldn't try that treatment. Yeah, and he did include at the end that he had been uh, managing with lanreotide injections after after multiple surgeries. So, yeah. um, I got a good. Uh, this is a good question from Bridget. That is, uh, I know a lot of a lot of people face. I think we had a similar question in in, in the previous weeks. Bridget says, hey, I'm a former patient of Dr. David Metz. Shout out to Dr. Metz oh, yes. who's on the show. Yep. And, and, and the question is, how do I get com comfort level with a new provider? It's so, it's so scary. You know, you find someone who, who, who's you've developed a relationship with you, knows your disease and you're comfort, comfortable with them. And for whatever reason, you need to go to another provider. Um, how, how do you suggest people establish a, a, that strong relationship with someone new? I mean, you know, I have to say that in this day and age, looking at reviewing records is so much easier because a lot of us have this medical record system called EPIC. And I have patients who come to me newly diagnosed and starting fresh, and that's great for me because then I don't have to review a lot of records. But I also have patients who've been, you know, I had a patient come to see me who saw Dr. Metz, who had been with him for, I don't know, like eight or nine years. Um, and I had to review all of his records and, and figure out what he's gotten, what he hasn't gotten and where he is at this moment uh, and, and figure out whether he's progressing or stable. So, you know, like it, it takes time to establish trust in relationships. It's not, there's no easy way for you to know ahead of time. Just like when you pick a spouse or you pick a good, a new friend, like, you know, you have to go through and see whether or not you're able to connect with them. They're able to explain things well to you. They're able to communicate with you in between appointments. If some complication happens or you get a scan and you're concerned about something, you know, you have no way of knowing that until you um, actually start the relationship. There are people in Philadelphia who, ha are, who are, have been working. Um, Nina is her name, Nimrata. She's at Fox Chase. Um, I, I, her last name starts with a, it's a complicated name. VJ Vergia. She was on the show a couple weeks yes. ago. And yeah. she's, she's a very passionate, enthusiastic young doc who loves neuroendocrine tumors, who's trained, who trained at, at Fox Chase and is somebody who treated a lot of neuroendocrine tumors. You know, so you want to go, you always want to go when you have a rare disease to somebody who's seen a lot of them, who's treated a lot of them, who's very comfortable with your disease state. And then you have to re understand whether or not you like that person and you connect with them. And there's no easy way around that until you meet them and you talk to them. Is, is there anything that the patient can do to help you all do your, your job better? Like, you know, we hear a lot in this, in this community about being your own best advocate. Right. Are, are there things that they can bring to the table to help, um, to help start to form and initialize that, that, that relationship? You know, I don't know, I have a nurse navigator and, and a secretary who are excellent. And whenever people come to me for a second opinion, um, then I automatically ask them to get the pathology slides so we can review them and to get all the CDs of the images. I mean, the reports are great, but sometimes we just need to look at the films too. Yeah. Um, and they automatically do that. If the person that you're going to see doesn't have that in place, then one of the things you can do is you can't do anything about the pathology slides because that's something that patients cannot carry but the CDs from all your scans, you should always have a copy with you and you should always keep them organized so that somebody doesn't reinvent the wheel. Like if you've had imaging and the imaging has been followed and shows your disease consistently, you don't want somebody to order a new different scan and then they don't know where you are because they're comparing apples to oranges. So the more information that we have, the more um, records that you keep and keep organized and it can help us stay organized with you so that we know exactly where you started and where you went. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, folks, we are about halfway through today's program. This is Lunch of the Experts at Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program. And our guest today is Dr. Sandy Kotaya. We're going to keep moving along. Great questions today, everybody. Uh, appreciate you very much. Our numbers are looking awesome. Let's keep the show moving forward. Tina says, I had a liver biopsy and I found out that I have an atypical carcinoid. What's the difference between atypical and typical? And this is a great kind of like <laughs> fundamental question. Uh, to address, I think. 
It is. And you know, it's so funny because even oncologists get those terms confused. So, you know, the reason that we're trying very hard to streamline some of the words that we use is because there can create a lot of confusion for, patient, for patients and other doctors, including oncologists, about what these terms mean. So carcinoid refers to a slow-growing neuroendocrine tumor. Atypical carcinoid refers to a slow-growing neuroendocrine tumor that has intermediate growth. So you know the, the, when you look at the pathology report for a neuroendocrine patient, you have to figure out, is it a well-differentiated or poorly differentiated tumor? Does it look more like the cells it started from, which is well-differentiated, or is it very disorganized and ugly looking that if you moved it somewhere else, you wouldn't be able to tell that it started from a hormone producing cell. That's poorly differentiated. So poorly, poorly differentiated tumors tend to grow faster and require chemotherapy. While differentiated tumors, generally speaking, okay, there's exceptions, tend to grow slower. So there's two things that they do additionally to work up the biopsy. One is KI-67, mm -hmm. which is a stain that they do. And the stain, however many cells are taking up that stain, they're trying to grow at the time of the biopsy or the surgery. And then mitotic rate is how many cells are dividing at the time of the biopsy or the surgery. So we look at both of those numbers and we take whichever one is higher. So there's low, intermediate, and high grade. So low grade neuroendocrine tumors are growth rates that are generally, KI-67 is less than three, mitotic rate is less than two. Intermediate grade tumors are KI-67 between three and 20, and mitotic rate between two and 20. And numbers above 20 are fast growing or high grade, right? Generally speaking, generally speaking. So when you're talking about atypical carcinoid, you're usually referring to long neuroendocrine tumors. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a little bit of cancer cell death, necrosis, and they are a little bit like intermediate grade. That's usually what we use that term. We don't usually use it in a liver biopsy. But I'm assuming that the person who read your liver biopsy is reading a well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor with growth rates between three and 20 for the KI 67 or between two and 20 for the mitotic rate, intermediate grade. I hope that makes sense. Got it, thank you so much. And Terry, uh, you had a question that was similar about uh, measurements of fast growing and slow growing. Uh, let me know if that answers your question or if you have a follow-up question. Okay. I will, I will tell you uh, the caveat to the question that Terry asked. Okay. At the end of the day, you get a biopsy. If somebody presents with metastatic disease, meaning it's spread to another organ, mm -hmm. and you're not necessarily thinking about doing surgery to really get accurate staging, the, the, the most accurate staging where you know exactly how much is involved, is involved where it started and how much it's spread to, when the surgeons cut, cut, cut it all out so you know exactly what's involved, what's not involved. But it's not always possible to do that. So you sometimes do clinical staging based on the scan, and then you get a biopsy of some random area, like the liver or something like that. And there will be 10 people in a row which have well-differentiated low grade, which is the slowest growing of the neuroendocrine tumor. Yet with those 10 patients, one of them might take, in fact, I just saw somebody today who's had symptoms for eight years, and she presented eight years later, and she had very little liver involvement after eight years. Mm. And, her, and you know, her surgery shows well-differentiated low grade. I've seen somebody else with well differentiated low grade, but within a year they had growth. So you take the biopsy with a grain of salt. Okay, what really tells you how fast growing or slow growing your tumor is is time and and imaging and following you over time. Because again, don't forget that when you get a small sample of a small area, there could be an area next to it that's faster growing. Usually not, but it can. So only time and following your scans will tell us how truly slow growing your biology is and how your how your cancer is going to behave. The other thing that tells us how you're going to do is when you present to us, because there's no good screening for, for neuroendocrine tumor, and most people have advanced cancer, stage three or stage four, what is your liver burden? Because if a lot of your liver is involved, you're already having a lot of symptoms and you're having weight loss and you have a carcinoid syndrome, which is when the carcinoid tumor, slow growing tumor is making less serotonin. Those patients have, are struggling with diarrhea, weight loss, <coughs> pain from their liver. They usually tend to do not do as well as the patients who present with less burden and you know, and we somehow were lucky enough to catch them in a place where their cancer is not completely overtaking their liver, which is how most people succumb to neuroendocrine tumors. So, you know, a, you know, a biopsy can give you some information, but only time will give you the most important information. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's hmm. how I, I approach the patients. Got it, got it. All right, moving on from Fred. Fred says, after my PRRT treatments and having octreotide injections, I had severe pain from the injection. 
from the injection site down to my ankle, making it hard to walk. Have you, Dr. Kataya, experienced any of this with, with uh, your patients before? Not really. I mean, I will tell you that the patients complain about injection site pain, period, not running down their leg necessarily, but having these nodules kind of pop up in like painful lumps that develop after they get the injections. And that's, that's, that is, that does happen. Now, I wonder if somebody hit a nerve somehow when they went in and give you an injection and that why, that's why it ran down your leg. So hopefully that will calm down after some time. If it doesn't, you probably need to have some imaging of your lower back just to make sure that there's not some coincidental pinch nerve or arthritis going on. Got it, got it. Well, thanks for your question, folks. If you are getting some value out of today's show, if you're getting some good answers to your questions, just type yes in the chat box for me and let me know that, uh, that you're having a good time and you're getting some good information. I always love to see uh, how everybody's responding to the show. Uh, we're going to keep taking questions. This is an interesting one from Ruby. Ruby says, how successful has chemotherapy been for NETS? Oh, Ruby, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> I guess it depends on what type of net you have, right? I mean, we don't really think of slow-growing endocrine tumors because by virtue of how chemotherapy works, it tries to kill things that grow quickly. And if you have an endocrine tumor that takes three years to divide in, in half, then chemotherapy is going to wait a long time to be effective because it's usually effective while you're giving it. It doesn't try to stick around for three years until the cells divide. So generally speaking, slow-growing endocrine tumors don't always have the best responses to chemo, which is why we do things like manipulating hormones with a lanreotide, octreotide, or we try to give targeted radiation, or we try to give pills that disrupt blood vessel growth. Chemotherapy works better in faster growing endocrine tumors, but does it cure them? No, it just buys you time. So the response rates are higher when it grows faster, but the chances of it coming back are, are also faster, are also high because chemo just buys you time. It doesn't fix things. So chemotherapy is certainly not the end all be all. It can potentially extend your life uh, and buy you more time. I have had some patients on Zolotemidar, which is the oral chemotherapy regimen that we use that John Strasberg has had developed many years ago. And I've had a patient on it for like nine years. He's had a patient on it for 15 years. Um, and I have some other patients who've been on it for four or five years where it's controlled their pancreatic endocrine tumors. So sometimes you can see some really long, amazing responses with, with some of the chemotherapy for the slower growing patients. Um, but in general, like I, I use it, you know, when I feel like the patient has no great option or when I feel like this is the only option, but it's not my go-to, especially for slow growing tumors. Got it. Well, thanks for your question, Ruby. Appreciate that. Hopefully that helped. Uh, I see a comment from Patricia who says, I'm lost too fast. I'm assuming that you're talking about uh, just, you know, some of the, the concepts that we're touching on, some of the answers that you're getting. So a couple of pieces of advice, Pat Patricia. Uh, one, if it is moving too fast, just know that uh, we are broadcasting live, but after the, the show is done, it's going to be posted here on the Facebook page. So it will live, it'll be evergreen, as they say on the videos tab here at, this, at CCS Facebook page, you can always watch it back. And certainly if you're still here and you have a question or need some uh, clarification, let us know in the comment section. We really wanna try to get those answers and, and get that information you're seeking. So hopefully that helps. Thank you for being here. Next question from Julie, for small bowel nets, uh, what may drive symptoms that are not carcinoid syndrome? So no flushing, skin lesions, wheezing, five uh, HIAA not elevated. But I have some similarity, diarrhea, shortness of breath, breath after eating some uh, amine-rich foods or amine-rich foods, peripheral neur neuropathy after uh, amine-rich foods, um, et cetera. Uh, so similarity carcinoid syndrome. That's a lot there, Julie. Uh, could whatever is the cause lead to damage to the heart in the way serotonin does in carcinoid syndrome or other damage to the body? Mm -hmm. That's oh. a very good question. By the way, I'm sorry, I'm going fast. I'm just trying to answer as many questions and give people as many as much time. So I'm, I apologize for that. But um, I was going to say, uh, the serotonin is probably the most famous hormone that we can A, measure and follow and have studied enough to know some of the damaging effects. There are probably other hormones that are being released by neuroendocrine tumors of different sites which might not cause always symptoms that we can pick up or they might, 
but we don't have technology to like test for them very easily. We know there are things like neurokinin and um, you know, bradykinin and other hormones that get released by some of these neurodegenerative tumors that could be causing some of your symptoms, but it's just not easy to measure them. Um, and as far as we know, you know, there's not some algorithm that if you're producing some of these other hormones that we can't easily measure or, or follow, that you should be getting an echocardiogram to look at your heart, or you should be getting some other testing because it can cause damage to other places. So I think that, you know, now that you've figured out that amine, contain, amine containing foods are triggering some of your symptoms, maybe hopefully cutting those out of your diet, which is easy for me to say, will help your quality of life and, and prevent some of these symptoms that you're having. And I'm very amused by the, uh, by Rain saying uh, H-I-A-A. And maybe I'll start saying that for my patients instead of saying 5 H-I-A-A. Uh, so I, <laughs> very, very amused. Uh, that wasn't even premeditated. It just kind of came yes, out that I, way. I've said yes. it both ways. But yeah. Like triple A, double A, I get it. Yeah, yeah. I like to be very efficient with my yes, communication. Yes, apparently. <laughs> Uh, somebody has to have said that before, though, when I'm talking to him, because it was. I'm not was, sure. I think it was the first time. It was somewhere in the back of my head. I don't know if I came up with that. Um, I, you know, I just deflect, right? I'm not going to take credit. Um, well, and there was a follow-up question there that uh, that Julie had, which should these symptoms go away or diminish if surgery successfully removes all tumors? You know, I I would think so, um, but you know. It's just one of those things where most of the time when people develop carcinoid syndrome or a lot of serotonin production, it's because the liver has been in, becoming involved with, this, with the neuroendocrine tumor. It's usually the ones from the small bowel, sometimes from the appendix, very rarely from the lung. Uh, and when the tumor is confined to the appendix or confined to the small bowel, it, doesn't, it can make some serotonin about 9% of the time. Um, and sometimes that might cause carcinoid syndrome, but it's usually when the liver is involved that the carcinoid syndrome becomes an issue. But the patient I saw today is still having carcinoid syndrome, um, despite the fact that the majority of her disease has been removed. So I would say to you that it's still possible. Um, you know, we sort of hope that it gets better. That's the whole point of doing the surgery and debulking a lot of these tumors. But it's still possible to, to have those, those uh, symptoms. Got it. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Michael says, I'm learning a lot here in Florida as usual. Thank you, doctor. Um, so everyone is appreciative of, of your answers okay, and I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's too fast. I think we're just covering a lot of ground. Uh, um, John says, this is one of the best resources for carcinoid syndrome questions. Great people asking great questions and rain with very knowledgeable guests. Uh, um, nice to go to your doctor with some ideas. Sometimes you can mention things they don't know. Well, John, absolutely. That is, that is what we uh, aim to achieve here at the show, just to kind of arm you with information and help everybody understand this disease a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, okay, next question from uh, Elaine. Octreotide must uh, must be, oh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong question. Where is your other question, Elaine? Oh, I missed it. Well, we'll go to Leanne. What are the side effects of lanreotide injections, if any? Mm -hmm. It's another loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you what I worry about. Uh, apart from like, you know, some people can sometimes have like increased gassiness, that's been a common complaint and not always easy to control. Mm -hmm. um, and so like bloating gassiness. But what worries me in the long run is some patients develop pancreatic insufficiency where the pancreas is not making enzyme as well, uh, because that's part of what somatostatin does. It controls some of the some of the hormones, some of the things that the pancreas makes. So when patients have been on octreotide injections for a while, I, I try to make sure that their stools are not floating and that they're not developing um, the need to be on Creon or pancreatic enzyme replacement. The other thing that can happen is blood sugar can increase over time. So if you're somebody who's diabetic, your diabetes can get worse potentially. So I always kind of keep an eye on that. The third thing that can happen is, you know, gallbladder issues. It's not very common, but it can happen where the bile kind of slows, the gallbladder gets inflamed. So a lot of, you'll see a lot of the surgeons when they go in to do an operation on neurodegenerative patients, they'll take the gallbladder out just because they don't want to have a potential for complication from long-term use of, of octreotide or, or lanreotide. Um, and then um, if you're on medications to control your heart rate, sometimes it can make your heart rate go lower when you're on the injections. So there are some things, I mean, overall, we think I think of it as a fairly well-tolerated drug, um, but there are some things that you should 
be aware of. There's sometimes zinc, de zinc deficiency on that drug. Sometimes we take zinc levels randomly. So, you know, those are sort of my general thoughts about, about the semestat analogs. Got it, got it, thanks. And it was um, Jan's question earlier that I was trying to find. Jan says, my net has been categorized as inoperable and I'm currently taking monthly santostatin injections. How much time can these injections hold off the inevitable? You know, so it works about two thirds of the time. It doesn't work in everybody, mm -hmm. um, but on average, it's usually years. Uh, it's, you know, some patients, I've had them on it. Some, one patient came to me and had been on it for about 10 years and was still controlling his disease. That's a little bit unusual and long, but there are people who really respond for, for a very long time. But I would say on, on an average, it was like, I would say a few years. It's usually not decades. Um, so that's sort of, you know, everybody's different, but that's sort of my take on it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, folks, I have a great comment from Jim. This is in reference to uh, Patricia's earlier co uh, comment that I, uh, that I mentioned saying I'm lost too fast. I just had to read this because I think it's so pertinent to, to everyone uh, tuning in, and especially if you're a first time or new to the show. Jim says, if you're joining for the first time, it can be overwhelming. And not everything you will hear is relevant to your case. Absolutely, Jim. Best advice I can give you is to summarize your situation in full for yourself with notes before attending the presentation. Come prepare with questions that you have about your case and then listen for topics and questions related to your situation. Keep notes as you listen and then go back and watch again at your own pace, plus one to that. Uh, you can also make notes of times when you hear, uh, make notes of the time, the time code, uh, when you hear topics that you relate to. So it's easy to find them when you go back and watch later. Best of luck to you, Jim. A couple of things. One, that was a masterclass in being a great attendee of Lunch with the Experts, I got to say. And secondly, you just showed one of my favorite things about the show, which is the community that, we, that we've cultivated here and you all helping each other out just as much as, as we and the guests are helping you. Uh, so I appreciate you so much for saying that. And another thing I will add, Patricia, is that we do these every week. So if you don't get a question asked, uh, come back the next week and, and, and ask it then. I think the real benefit comes from showing up. And most of the people that are in the comment section are here every week, every Thursday at 12 Eastern time. Okay, we've got about 10 more minutes, folks. Let's answer some more questions. Sarah says, most treatments for cancer are considered ke chemotherapy. I know that lanreotide is not chemotherapy. What is it classified as? Uh, I, well, first of all, I must say that I think Jim must be an engineer. Uh, that's my <laughs> guess, He's very organized. Sounds but like anyway, um, I will say that I think of it as hormonal manipulation. Okay. So what I tell the patients is, you know, when you're eating and you're extracting sugar from your meal and your pancreas is making insulin, mm -hmm. so metastatin is the hormone that's doing that without you controlling it. And it's being produced by your pancreas. When you stop eating and you go for a run, and you need that glucagon to kick in so that you can use the sugar for energy. The somatostatin, again, is going around in your body to turn on the glucagon and turn down the insulin so your sugar doesn't drop. So most hormone-producing cells, not in endocrine tumors, the, hormone, the regular hormone-producing cells that you have in your thyroid, your pancreas, your adrenal glands, have one or two receptors for somatostatin because that's how they get controlled. The endocrine tumors that you have, the slow-growing ones, usually have about over 50 receptors. And we pick them up on these gallium scans. And then when we give the somatostatin and it's in the, the drug form, it can last 28 days. In, the, in your body, it lasts two or three minutes. It's usually very fast acting. So we, the somatostatin that we give you in a depo form usually goes and blocks those receptors and manipulates those receptors to number one, control hormone production if you're making too much serotonin. Number two, to try to slow down the growth of norepinephrine tumors, which they discovered, which they were able to show very nicely with the clarinet study from the Landriotide group. So, you know, so that, so we don't think of it as chemo because it's not trying to kill whatever's growing fast. It's specifically trying to manipulate the hormones um, and use the hormones to control the tumor. Got it. Well, thanks, Sarah. I appreciate your question. Uh, Jim chimed in and he said, no, uh, not an engineer, a banker, which I think is also oh, so someone... Still. Someone Still. you would want to be uh, organized. I think. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, Sharon says, uh, how can nets be considered non-functioning or non-functional if they are metastasized? 
actually a majority of Norna consumers are non-functional. 80% of them are non-functional. We just hear about all the functional people because they have the most symptoms and you know they have a more dramatic presentation. But a lot of them are growing without any hormone production. And then the patients present because it's causing pain because it's pressing on something or it's like blocking up the small bowel or it's making somebody yellow if it's in the pancreas or it's causing a cough because it's pressing on the airway in the lung. So, so, and then it spreads to the liver and you have no idea because it's not making the hormone production necessarily. Although people have years of diarrhea before they get diagnosed sometimes. So, so, you know, it's very common to see somebody who's like completely no symptom production and they have like a liver with metastasis from the neuronal tumor and a, and a tumor sitting in their small bowel or the pancreas or the lung where it started from. And, and we see more of that than we see patients with, with hormone production because not all of these tumors will retain their ability to make hormones. Got it. Thanks for your question, Sharon. Um, okay, yeah, Sarah says, thanks for answering my question. It's very helpful in explaining to others who asked. Absolutely, Sarah, that's why we're here. Uh, Wendy says, my pancreas that, that's left is, no, is non-functioning um, uh, and I'm not a diabetic. Any, any thoughts? I'm not quite um, sure. Yeah, I'm I mean, really, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Are you talking about your tumor is non-functional or? Yes, yes. Is not working? Yeah, my pancreas that's left. And so I think that there was a, a surgery. Yeah, you had Whipple, right, Wendy, if I remember correctly? And then she says, uh, I'm not diabetic. Any thoughts? Yeah. Did, if, did they anything, remove your whole, whole pancreas or just part of it? No, she was, she says my pancreas that's left is non, is non-functioning. Um, so that leads me to believe that can't be, not, that can't be right. Cause if it was not functioning, if you weren't making any insulin or glucagon, you would definitely be diabetic if it was not functioning at all. Um, so I'm not, maybe that's sure the question. It. Cause she's saying I'm not diabetic with a question mark. Um, or am I? Yeah. Yeah, let, let, Wendy, if you're still around, which I know that you usually tune in for the whole show, let us know if there's uh, there's something else that that, uh, that you can add to that um, so that we can get you that that answer. Okay. Um, the Oh, yeah. Wendy says the head uh, is is removed, the head of the pancreas. Right, that's the Whipple Sprite. Mm -hmm. But the rest of your pancreas must still be working because you're not diabetic yet. So, and hopefully you won't be, you know, but that's always the risk when they remove part of your pancreas that you're... That well, here, here, Jim, actually, our friend Jim has a very similar question. So let me, let me ask this one and, and it might, uh, it might play to Wendy's question too. So Jim says, I've had 75% of my pancreas removed. So not all of it, splenectomy, gallbladder removed and a few, uh, uh, uh HEPA, hepatectomies, um, on land re I'm on land reattide injections for two years. And as I said, uh, previously, no receptors present. So limited treatment options. Obviously, diabetes is a concern, but I'm not currently diabetic. Uh, have floating stool regularly. What supp supplements would you recommend exploring? Well, the floating stools, you have to look into pancreatic enzyme replacement, the creon. Just okay. make sure that you're not having pancreatic insufficiency. Jim, you, do have, you have options. We talked about that. You know, like you... You might not be able to get PRT, but there's you know other medications we can give you, uh, and you can also get lipid directed therapy. So I hope you're not thinking to yourself that land reattide and then you're out because that's not true. We have other things we can offer you, including like you know there's a little and and you know sutin or everolimus or lipid directed therapy. But you know um, obviously if you worry about the development of diabetes in people who you remove the pancreas because you know that's the risk that they that you take uh, and they might develop in the future. So you just have to be vigilant. There's ways to track that. Um, by blood work. And then you guys have to watch for blurry vision, increased urination um, mm -hmm. as signs of blood sugar going up in between appointments, you know, pretty much. Got it. You know, uh, Dr. Kataya, when we first started the program, we, we talked about you creating your, your net uh, program uh, 11 years ago. Um, I'm curious, you know, I know I, from talking to enough doctors and enough experts, I know that there's been a lot that's happened in the previous 10 years, specifically in this disease. Um, what, what events or what, um, treatments that have, have come through that, what has happened in those 10 years since when you started your program that it has helped you do your job more effectively in terms of serving? That's a, the great, qu that's a great question. We only had octreotide when I started. Right. And then Everolimus came along not too long after that. Um, but octreotide had been the only treatment for, for decades. Um, before um, I started this program. 
And I was sort of like, what do I do? This person's progressing on a treat. I don't have anything else, maybe liver directed therapy, mm-hmm. you know, and now we have, you know, octreotide, the land retired, the cousins coming along and octreotide tablets are coming along. Oh, wow. Um, so, and then we have, you know, Zermelo, which is a pill that helps to control carcinoid syndrome. If people have breakthrough diarrhea on, on the land retired or octreotide, we have PRT for some patients. We have Sutin. There's a drug called cabozatinib that's coming down the pipeline. Heard about um, that. There's newer ways of giving liver directed therapy. So certainly like the treatment or momentum for neuroendocrine tumors is expand for slow growing patients. Okay. For fast growing patients, we've had a new chemotherapy drug called Zepzelka that came out. Immunotherapy has been coming out and helping some patients. And that's been added onto some of the fast growing tumors. So we are making breakthroughs. We are making headway and patients are living longer with their neuroendocrine tumors, even though they probably would live a while just without treatment. If they have the slow growing ones, um, they can live some years without treatment, but they can live even longer with treatment. So I, I'm very like, you know, um, happy about all the advances that we're making. And I'm thankful to people like John Strasberg and uh, the, the big uh, clinical re- like research people who are pushing new treatments through, pushing new trials through. I mean, he's the one who got PRT approved in the U.S. essentially with this big trial with multiple multiple cancer centers involved, a big collaboration. So I think that you know we're getting trials open and closed <coughs> a lot faster. Remember that the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society is only 11 years old, uh, whereas the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society is like over 50 years old and they've won three Nobel Prizes. So, but we're catching up to them. You know, we're catching up to them and we're, we're definitely expanding our treatment. And there's a lot of physicians who are interested in pushing the care forward. I've op- I'm opening up like another two or three trials in the next couple of months. So things are getting better. And I know it's hard to, you know, um, see, see the long view, but I'm very glad that you asked that question because I do think that we've made a lot of progress and it might not always feel that way, but we have. Let's take that timeline and that, that 10 years that we just looked at and shift it forward to 2031, which seems like, how's that even a real year? Uh, what do we have to look forward to? Just as we saw that growth in the previous 10 years, what do you see coming? What are you hopeful for in the next 10 years? Will we have the same leaps and bounds that we had in the previous decade? I think so, because I think technology is getting better. We're sure. able to analyze cancer cells uh, and a massive like um, analysis. Oh, sorry. Uh, something just popped up on my screen. No and way. so, so you know, I'm hoping that there's going to be more treatment options, less toxicity, more, no more targeted treatments, smarter treatments, um, and, and you know, and having having way more uh, options for patients with endocrine tumors to like pick and choose from. So that if somebody doesn't tolerate something, we have the next thing. So that's what I'm hoping for, an explosion of treatments, different treatments, smarter treatments. Got it, got it. Uh, just a couple of comments from the, from the audience. Lorraine says, awesome show today. Uh, Melvin says, have enjoyed what I saw today. I'll watch the rest later, but I hope that she will come back another time. Aww, Dr. Kataya has been very good. And yes, you, Rain, are always good. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully Dr. Kataya will come back some days. And I think that uh, that uh, all you all at home with your excellent questions made us look good and maybe, maybe she will. So um, absolutely great show today. Dr. Kataya, we appreciate you being here and, and sharing some time with us and some information with our with our community as well. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a lot of fun. It was, I hope I get to meet some of you one day. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you all at home, uh, at home as always. We hope this uh, program helped answer some of your questions. And again, reach out to CCF if you have any other follow-up questions. Um, thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, this program wouldn't be possible. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching. And please join us next week on Lunch with with the Experts. I am looking at a beautiful beach and I'm going to go run out there right now. So stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.